So he had to take a 3D scan of the duck's stump and then design the model based on his other foot. It's also a great use case for 3D printing for, mul for multi-materials here. So this is a material that they had to make a mold and make it out of silicon afterwards. And this is a direct 3D printed model where they have um, a, f a flexible material, as Daniil was talking about, rigid material here for like the knee uh, or the, uh, the, p the point of articulation, and then the actual flipper bit, I'm sorry, I'm not a vet, um, uh, was made of the flexible material. So can you do not just not ducks? So the answer is obviously yes, but you might want to stick with ducks. So these people here, the Enable um, project, they make 3D printed individualized prosthetics. And the idea of these are mechanically activated. So these are people that still may be the missing part of their hand or they make some full, uh, they have some articulation in the elbow. But basically, uh, these, are th these can be 3D printed and the models are all freely available. And basically you can make a prosthetic for less than 40 pounds. And um, the idea for this is, the benefits of 3D printing is you can individualize it. So you can just change the model and hit print. So between, um, so if say if you were mass producing a prosthetic, then you would have to have a, like a, a fixed geometry which you then change, or maybe adapt, or someone has to manually change the, the, like the, the thing that's been kind of CNC machined. They have to kind of hand tool it to fit. But with 3D printing, you can scan and change the model and hit print. And the idea there is the reason why you want to make it low cost is obviously not it's just obviously for applications where there's low access to healthcare, but also if you have a kid, prosthetics are very expensive. So you often can't get one. Maybe you have get maybe one every year if the traditional way. Meaning and between that year they've grown a lot. So maybe you want to change one every three months. And if they cost a thousand pounds each time, that becomes prohibitive. But if you can just change one part here on the wrist and then you just 3D print that bit and it grows with them. Also, the other part is they found one, the interesting thing here, so this is fully 3D printed, all this is, is just some, st some strings, like some fishing tackle wire or something like that. And this has also got some other, so uh, in fact, the $40, 40 quid is mostly shipping from the slightly funny fishing uh, material. But also they found, the interesting thing with this is they found that kids, the more they made it look like a real hand, the less that the younger kids kind of were interested in it. They wanted it to look like a robot hand. They wanted it. To, they've, you know, from their answer is like, I wh why would I not have a Spider-Man hand? You give me a plain hand and a Spider-Man hand. I mean, how many kids do you know that would pick the plain hand? So the good thing about that is, that, you know, you might not be into Spider-Man. Maybe you're into some other thing from the Avengers. I'm sorry, I don't know anything. But something from the MCU. So you can change the model, and then. Um, so this is also great for generating specific um, components for maybe when the whole device is more complicated, but maybe the mechanical parts can still be made a lot cheaper. So this is uh, Open Bionics. So in fact, we saw a video of someone printing this exact hand, this one here. So this is an early version, and this is one made. So this is this one here, working right now. And um, this is this one doing, and of course, I was doing an undergrad project. And of course, they connected it so such that it gave you the middle finger. So um, I was not able to use most of the footage from this in any other talk. But the good thing is that we're in a pub here, so we can use the I can actually use the thing that students spent two days making. So this is an early version. You can see this is fully 3D printed here. And now they actually got an NHS clinical trial with this. So this is the latest version. So basically, this this entire thing is all 3D printed from different materials, and. Um, She's, she's got a, um, an EMG sensor underneath, so some electrodes on her elbow. So basically she's clenching her elbow and the muscles here, and it's detecting the activity, and that causes the, the bionic arm to clench. And that's actually the first time they tried it, they said. That's the first time they ever tried it, and it's the first time that it worked. So that she just put it on and she tried catching something, so she's never ever caught anything with her hand. And the idea of, yes, prosthetics exist, you can buy one like this, but it's about 80,000 pounds or something like that. But this one is much, much cheaper. It's several thousand because all the complicated, expensive, tailored bits are actually 3D printed. So this is something that is for sure coming and um, is use, used. Um, so it's in the NHS. It's successfully passed our NHS trial. So expect to see that quite soon as a quite a regular thing. So this is something that you might have seen in the news relatively recently. Maybe you have a different profile on Facebook, so you get different adverts to me. But this is the kind of thing that I get on my Facebook, because they know too much about me and all of us, is um, 
This is a 3D printable stethoscope. And um, this is, I want to dwell on this a little bit because it's a perfect example of maybe you might not quite understand why 3D printers are so good. Hopefully, you got the impression that despite us talking about the disadvantages and the fact they don't work all the time, that we like 3D printing and we think that they can do good stuff. So this is a stethoscope which costs less than $5 to make. It matches a stethoscope of about $200. You see here, this is the basically the acoustic profile. This is the attenuation um, of the frequency, as Daniel was talking about. It's the same thing. And basically, this black one is the expensive, about $200, $300 one, which most doctors you see walking around. And this one here is basically they've managed to match it by carefully designing the 3D printer, the 3D printable materials. So you can see A, B, C, and D are just 3D printable stuff which can be printed by exactly this kind of printer. Here they are mass producing it. And these other parts here are just some tubing and actual headphone earbuds. But actually, the and anyone can print these 3D printed models, which is fantastic. I 3D printed them, and I wanted to show off the stethoscope for this talk. But actually, the really interesting thing is these people, GLIA, are based in Canada and Gaza. So without going into any politics, it's fair to say it's a bit complicated to get materials when you're in Gaza. That's a not, not controversial thing to say. So, but people in Gaza and Canada were able to get hold of this film, which is just um, like a uh, kind of, you know, the binder material that you would have on, like in, in between files and folders. They just bought it from Staples, right? They could buy it in Canada and they could buy it in Gaza, but you can't buy that in Europe. So you can't, you can, so I bought some 3D, some other file folder material, assuming it would be the same, and then it's not and it doesn't work and you can't hear anything because it doesn't have the right material properties. So you can print the hard part, because if you have a 3D printer in Gaza and you have the 3D printer in Canada, you can hit print in the other side of the world and you get the same thing. So the more things you 3D print, the way you can communicate that design to people. But if you want a certain type of plastic that's not 3D printable, then maybe staples don't sell it in Europe. So that's just a really kind of interesting thing of maybe kind of 3D printing kind of looks a bit kind of maybe it's, uh, it's like you've, you're doing it for the sake of it, but actually being able to just take any filament that you get, and in Gaza they actually, they run these on batteries, they run it on solar panels, and they recycle all their filament. So all of this is made you know, off the grid, and they still get the same results as you do in Canada. So here we had the break. I just want to say that was 3D printed beer. Um, and so another example, we're moving on to medicine now. So I'll just try to introduce and then we'll move on. Yeah, yeah, okay. So surgical planning. Daniel's already talked about it a little bit earlier, but basically, and we had the talk at the, at the beginning, is basically surgical planning is kind of like finding a route through a cave, right? You want to go from here, outside, into a specific bit which you want to cut. As again, I'm not a doctor, but that's, you know, you want to cut out a bit that you don't want it to be in there, right? And 2D maps, when you look on a screen, assume that caves look like this, which is from Ultima or some game like that. But basically, it assumes caves are flat and 2D, right? So it's very easy to visualize how you get from there to there. But a real cave is incredibly complicated. This is, some, this is a cave in Mexico. So you want to find a route from here to there, maybe. So visualizing that on a 2D screen is quite difficult, quite a challenge. So an important part, particularly with brain surgery, as you may have heard that it's a bit complicated, is that pre-surgical planning is important. So you want to basically, the surgeon wants to visualize where they're gonna go, what the vasculature they want to avoid, and they plan basically where they're gonna cut, what, you know, what size tools they need, how, you know, who's gonna do what in what order, and they kind of need to understand and visualize where they're going to go. So this is an example of how you could do it. So, and if you have a tangible 3D object, and you want to decide how to go, and you can hold it in your hand, it's much, much easier. So these black bits here are just for support. So that person wasn't seriously ill and had all of these things impaled in their brain. But here, particularly, they were trying to, I think it was a tumor they were trying to avoid, uh, trying to remove, and what they wanted to do is avoid the vasculature, basically. And they were trying to find a path that they could cut with as simple as possible and avoid all the red stuff, basically. That's about as far as my medicine goes, so that the red stuff should stay inside. And um, yeah, so Daniel will tell you a bit more about how it's actually done. So uh, in general, uh, in order to get, um, create the medical model, like one of them I pass around, one of the skull, I'll talk a bit later. Um, you want first to get the medical image data. 
So there are many technologies, different technologies, optical, uh, electrical, um, what's it? basic MRI, CT, and so on. There are so many different technologies. So you get a series of 2D, Im 2D images, whatever way people come up with, um, and combine it together. The problem with it, um, sometimes it's not automatically you can get the 3D model that can be 3D printed. You need to do a bit of work. Whether you need to come up with a clever uh, programming code that will sort your problem, maybe machine learning, if people do that, um, or you do it manually. So what you do, you just uh, section the area that you're interested in, uh, and that's called segmentation. There are many tools, both commercial and uh, public available if you, if you need it for your research. If there are some researchers here, please talk. I'll happy to guide you. Um, and then after you segmented the area you're interested, you still need to do the refinement. Remember, he showed the wheel that's been, uh, or other example where very difficult to print because there are too many um, kind of instruction we need to give to 3D printer. In order to simplify this work, you can uh, create, simplify the mesh. So remove all the unnecessary detail that actually your scan give you and simplify it. Yes, it may be uh, slightly go away from the actual medical image, but at the same time it allowed to make the model printable which is, at the end of the day, that's exactly what you want. Um, here, I'll show you an example. Uh, can you run this video, the first one? Uh, it's called cryoablation. Um, at the bottom, yeah. So here, uh, you have a CT scan of the bone, and the person, the child, uh, had a cancer in the bone, which caused quite a lot of pain. But for surgeon, it's very difficult to remove that, uh, because of the red bit, that um, uh, kind of tumor, um, it's kind of very close to um, bone and also, more importantly, very close to uh, nerve, which is in yellow. And what I did, I segmented different areas together with clinicians. I'm not a clinician as well, uh, but I work with them. So we sit down together, I use my tools to get the metal and then say, nope, this is wrong, this is right, and then we correct it together. Um, so together we managed to get this, and then after that, um, for cryoablation, what it does, it put the needle in, and you freeze the the cell that you want to kill. Um, so we together, uh, I helped the clinician to put the needle in the right orientation, and what more important for clinician was, he told me, that while he was working on the model and he actually learned and memorized the, the anatomy of that particular child. Um, and then after that, when, we done, when he was doing the surgery, and I've been sitting at the back, it's quite nice when, um, when we're doing the model, I've been working and he was watching it. And then when we went to the surgical room, he was working and I was watching it, nice. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, he slightly changed it till wasn't, ideal way, but uh, it helped him to plan the surgery, help him to analyze how far he can put the needle. Um, and in this case, we didn't print, but we used the segmentation. I thought that was quite nice of medical data and get the model right. Right? So this is just a particularly fancy version of this. So this is in um, in the Mayo Clinic, so obviously they can use all the latest fancy toys. And this is example here. Um, again, you probably don't have to be a clinician to understand that this big black lump inside the lung probably shouldn't be there. So this is another way of planning the surgery. As you see, it's particularly difficult because they want to try and preserve as much of the rib and they want to avoid all of the vasculature here. So they printed all of the, they segmented, segmented the layers here and printed it all at um, printed it all off and then the basically also um, part of the problem is when you're having such a complicated surgery when you're talking to the patient to explain what you're going to do some people don't want to have that much information and some people do so this particular patient was um, was a doctor himself and really wanted to kind of see so the surgeon could basically say this is your chest this is how I'm going to go in this is what I'm these are the tools the exact tools that I've sized and I know I'm going to use the right size tools and I can cut it up and this is how we're going to remove it and this is, um, in this particular clinic now, this has um, gone beyond like a proof of principle or a PR exercise. This is now how uh, quite commonly they do this for these particular complicated surgeries. I think uh, what um, I remember that I work with some um, 
clinicians who work with children, uh, pediatric clinicians, is quite important because very often when the child is ill, um, they come to the doctor and doctor explain you need to do particular surgery, go malformation, removing malformation. So you have several options. You need to cut it out. You can do this particular, uh, I don't know, x-ray and then after do some other, other procedures, you can suck it out or whatever. And then the, what happened to parent? He's a panicking and I have no idea what you're talking about. He showed black and white screen on ultrasound and he, they don't see anything. Um, and then the model like that, it actually really help. And I, what I do as well, um, I help to develop those model. So it's good for parents to better understand the situation, uh, kind of see what the options are. Uh, because I very interestingly, I thought I'll create a 3D model and then my clinician told me, yes, amazingly well done. You help us to do better surgery and help us. When I created the, the model and I showed the clinician, the clinician look at it and say, you know what? Actually, it's much easier if I look at MRI in 2D series of 2D images. Like what? I'm working so hard to get a 3D model for you. Uh, <laughs> But, and he explained to me that actually, because they are trained this way, um, and for many, many years, they trained that they used series of 2D images. They're like a, a machine. So they just look t 2D images, and they already know the anatomy in the head. I'm, I'm amazed at clinicians, how the brain works, slightly different than my brain work. Um, they just trained for so many years that they get used to it. Um, and and um, so for them, actually, the 3D model, it's not so important. But for um, patients, it's crucial. They need to understand that. They cannot see the black and white images. And, under and a clinician sometimes, uh, it was very interesting, clinician showed me the 2D images. Uh, even myself sometimes struggle to get this, even though I've been I'm working with medical uh, data. And, and then he put it together, a series of images. And then so it's very clear that that uh, not going to work. And like, wait a second, let's do 3D models and then I will see whether it actually works or not. But they, he already put them up in his head very quickly. Uh, just an example that uh, sometimes 3D printing is good, sometimes it's not, um, kind of quite interesting. So um, another thing that uh, we wanted to, you know, one more back uh, quickly. Uh, now uh, I want to split the talk in the kind of three sections. Uh, we'll give you quite a number of examples. Um, 3D printing for the medical models and medical kind of simulation phantoms uh, could be used in three ways. One, creating a mold. So for example, here, it's one of the first brain I've uh, built it. So what I did, I just um, segmented a portion of the brain and I have four of those blocks and then fill in the material. I think I used silicon this time. Um, and then I put things together, and this way I get the, a, a brain. And the mold, um, another example, for example, this box, white box there, um, I use for training um, uh, purposes. So sometimes um, clinician, especially the, the brand new clinician, a student in particular, um, they have struggling of the learning how to put the needle in the right place. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, I remember um, one day I was giving some injections and I knew this person doing probably the first or second time, I one of the first patients. And my reaction was, please help, can somebody else do this? The resident, this person, shaking hands and then, no worries, I'll do fine and you see the person trembling more than you see yourself. And so the idea of this, uh, I was just explaining uh, how I've done it, but um, not going into the details. The idea is you have this box, then you have a rod inside, which was all 3D printed. Then you fill in with the uh, tissue mimicking material, and then you remove the rod and you get the vessels. I think the next image there. Um, so you can create vessels, and on ultrasound you can see it. And, and this way you can play the needle and you practice as many times as you like. And uh, we have already done two studies, one in the Great Ormond Street Hospital, another one in, in UCLH, um, UCL Hospital. And this way um, clinicians gave us feedback and especially students, they were happy. At least I can practice somewhere else instead of going to actually to the patient. And we appreciate that, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, if you ask example at the moment, some another work I do at the moment, uh, I'm developing models, uh, kidney stone, um, something that happens and uh, particular work with the unit that face difficult cases. 
where you need um, unique uh, anatomy of the kidney uh, and a unique, unique location of the stone. And at the moment, I'm developing a model where it helps the clinician to practice the surgery. That's another um, aspect that is quite important. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of other images, uh, examples. Uh, I think we can skip that. Yes. Um, another thing that, that something that I don't know if you recognize, it. know what that is? Not brain, no. All right, maybe uh, we'll get to give a prize. Sorry, what? I can hear. Yeah, you've got it. Go get the ear one there. Have an ear. Have an ear. Oh, that good gauge. Well done. <laughs> good. So that's uh, placenta. Um, yeah? yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, an example, you can vasculature placenta and you can study use the, using the mold. All right. Got to be quicker than that. Right. Uh, this this one. So, a few more slides, just uh, save a bit of time, otherwise, we'll keep talking about uh, different things. Um, direct printing. Um, remember I mentioned that um, 3D printing for developing medical model is not great? Well, it's partially not great. It's great for bone partially only. Or for example, here um, people have done uh, two material printing and, and create a spinal uh, cord to the spinal insertion needle. Um, also, that something I've been working on, uh, developing particular pipeline, how to develop 3D printed brains, some of those brains around. And what is required, so maybe quickly overview, on the left hand side you have MRI scanner, you get some T1 images, you need a computer to process, to segment it, and after that you do this way, I work with some clever software guy, he says, yeah, yeah, no problem, we'll do the cluster desktop computer in our lab and something else like I don't know what he's done, but uh, clever computing that everything done automatically. And then you've got the images, and then after that, I step in and then get um, uh, clearing the models and 3D printed. Um, the great thing would be, for example, this one, particular for children, and explain them so different part of the brain, the kind of different function. Um, some of them responsible for vision, some of them responsible for movement, and so on. Um, other aspect. Oh, that's yours. So, a quick thing of something that I did in my own research was um, I I did electrical impedance tomography. So I wanted to replicate the electrical properties of the skull. And uh, as you can see here, the different layers, the thickness and the ratio of this kind of is called diplo, which is about one of the only medical terms that I do know, is that that's kind of the soft, spongy stuff between the, the layers of bone. And the ratio of that means the skull has different thickness. And what I did was I uh, made a, uh, and worked with some, um, some people that make custom make uh, PLA, the material in this. And we tried, to we tried to use conductive PLA. So rather than print something that's completely insulating like normal plastic, it's conductive too. And the idea is basically the outcome was, yes, you can, but it's very hard to print because it basically turns into something like dry spaghetti. So it breaks before you even put it through this tube. So that's again, definitely on the um, expert level. So uh, let's get the molding ones, it's boring. Okay, so a cool um, aspect, as we were saying, the direct printing. So now what's happening more and more is that I think if you go on 3dprint.com, every single week there's a different company basically that's got a new FDA approval for a titanium laser sintered metal implant. So the idea of this, look how happy this guy is. He's got a whole division of Johnson & Johnson making this. Look how happy that he is. So, um, and because he invented this, which is a um, custom uh, laser sintered implant. And basically the idea of this is, uh, more and more companies have done it. So this is a, um, for the, the prints just finished, that's why it's loud. So they've also, basically you, you, you imagine if you took something off the shelf, it's much better to have it tailored, right? So you can take your CT scan and you can say, this is the bit of bone that is missing. And I'll make that model exactly. 
So that way, basically, if you imagine a kind of a surgery, you want to connect an uh, implant, like a hip implant or something, you basically have to take one off the shelf at the moment, size it and go, okay, well, I need to remove some of the bone to make it fit or I need to kind of hack things away to try and make these parts fit. But it's much, much better to make something that's actually the right size. So you have to, you can remove as little material that already exists and it fits better. So this is becoming more and more common. So this is, will for sure be start sound of practice in various places soon because it's got FDA approval. Next one. So this one is another one that basically has, didn't get FDA approval um, for uh, this only had it because it was an emergency uh, operation but well, basically you can see here again i'm not a doctor but your lung should be connected to your uh, to your neck basically so that's another <laughs> that's a, no, i'm not a doctor but basically that bit should be connected to there and this was in a um a lesson th it was um two when it happened and basically they made something that would dissolve so basically they made like a, a scaffold so basically they put that around the surgery they 3d printed and tested it it fit exactly to what it uh, the shape that it would be and also would stretch and grow with the patient and then basically you see after a year it started to regrow the bronchus so this is something that is not common because of fda approval they got it because it was emergency surgery but this is an example of how it could be used um uh, uh in the future another example uh the pituitary gland so the model that the skull that going around has actually been designed for particular um the model create this um phantom so pituitary gland is actually quite small piece um to sit next to the brain or part of the brain um and actually what happened when you actually see the bit blob here over there that actually something wrong went there and this gland is quite important if a woman has a problem with this gland the w she wouldn't have any children uh, so a quite small piece but that responsible over the uh, production of the hormones and and also there are some type of cancer that they give the wrong type of hormones and sometimes it grow a bigger. So what I do, so I developed, yeah, just an example how the early surgery has been done, um, some inventions. So the way it worked, um, you use endoscope. Uh, endoscope, I don't know if you know, the, the metal tube with the light inside and a camera, so it's like basically a camera, uh, a thin camera. You can put inside through the nose and pituitary gland. And so what I developed there, the, the a skull, it have actually on the side of it, there are a few holes there. And the hole there, it, in order to uh, kind of practice different angles, you can, you can different ways how you can put, uh, get into that uh, place. Um, yep. And uh, another one, uh, this one, uh, in other ways, what, another type of tumor, uh, in a brain where you can, the only way you can get in is actually coming from a side. So some of the brain where you just remove completely the ear, which is quite uncommon, but uh, they justify that because the only way to remove it, it actually goes through the ear. Um, yes, per patient lose hearing on one ear completely, uh, but this way they remove, uh, it's called transphenoidal surgery, but I think it's uh, even complicated for me. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, the, the idea is the, the surgeon, they need this type of um, model so they can not only practice, but also in, in our team, we have people who develop novel devices. So we try to use these models um, to validate new technologies as well. Uh, because for FDA approval, sometimes they say, what, what have you done in order to prove it? Or you, you cannot say, I just make someone deaf and then prove it that my technology doesn't work, right? Um, so that's why I need some type of models that are realistic and at the same time are good in order to prove it. Um, and what I did as well, um, I developed um, a novel 3D printer. And remember mentioned I wasn't happy about the material and I thought why not I develop the printer that can use the material that can be flexible then also ultrasonically clear and acoustically clear and this way that's what I did and actually that's one of my first um, can, can, oops, go back can you, can you run it um, so that's actually the proof of concept so what you do we just 
with one of my colleagues, um, we found so uh, a pump. What? First prototype. <laughs> yeah, Charlie. Sorry about that. Say that. Um, so the, the idea was um, to have a pump, which is pump the material, and you see, can quite an old lab and old equipment, probably in uh, 1980s or something. But whatever we found it, that's how we d proved the concept, and it it we just manual printing of the material basically. And then after that, um, after a couple years of research. Um, I managed to build my own prototype printer uh, together with one uh, company, a few engineers. Uh, actually, the first cup uh, using the flat, uh, the soft material, um, and then I printed also a brain. Actually, we have some samples here, um, and this is the ultrasound image, which looked like like what you actually using a regular ultrasound. The good thing about um, this printer, you can run it this one. You can also um, can you run the video? Um, you can also uh, use several materials. So here I used uh, material with two different properties and I also two different colors. And it's the first one of its own kind that you can use not only flexible, not only ultrasonically and acoustic clear, but also with different properties. And it's quite important, especially when, you meet, uh, when you're imaging cancer, that way you get the boundary and very often surgeons don't know the boundaries, where the tumor is finished, where not. And you can tell that only investigating the properties of the material. And that's what um, I did. I put the color in just in case I could visually could see it, uh, because you, otherwise you don't see it. Um, only You can see it only if you do the image of it. All right. So we're going to do bioprinting, which is a whole field with whole departments very quickly. So uh, apologies for anyone in bioprinting that I give this short shrift. Okay, so the goal or dream of people with 3D printers is can you print a whole organ using human cells? Can you go to the computer and say, I'd like a heart, please? Can you print me a face? So basically the idea of this is it is basically very similar. You convert the tree. We have our ear here. It's probably even the same ear that they printed and you visualize it and basically instead of putting plastic down, you put human cells. So they kind of, in terms of actually developing the technology, it's quite sim it's relatively simple in terms of the 3D printing. What's difficult is the gel. You need to get, take a delicious mixture of heart, fat and cartilage cells, mix them together and then if you, but if you injected that on a dish, again, I'm not a biologist, but if you inject it on a dish, they would die, okay? So what you need to do is give it all the stuff that you need to, for these cells to, to grow and so basically that's what these bio inks are that we're talking about. Basically it's a way of, uh, you basically it makes these droplets here of the, of the bio layer. These people are calling it bio paper because they wanted to separate it from the rest. You s put it in layer by layer by layer. You put it all of the, you um, infuse that, um, that dish with the stuff that the cells need to grow and it grows into the shape that you need. And the idea of that is you could then 3D print an ear. So this is basically, if you look, the point here is that look at this machine, it's got an X, Y, and Z plane, it's got stepper motors, it's exactly the same, right? They've just put a syringe on the end of it. And basically, this um, ear that we saw earlier in the talk, this is exactly how it was printed. So they have the red stuff and the white stuff and, and the blue, so some of this is the support scaffold, so some of this is just like the, the food that the cells need. Because if you imagine if you print something in the middle, and then you put it inside a dish and you infuse it with all of the, of the food. I know, I'm saying food, but you know what I mean? You need all the, the chemicals that you need. It's not going to survive. So what you have to do is you have to give it a channel for it to be able to, uh, get, all, um, to, to get all the nutrients that it needs. And being able to actually do this is the holy grail in bioprinting. And as again, we already saw that I actually saw on 3dmednet.com. So um, this, exact, this is a bio-ink skin. So the idea of this is, we saw this exact GIF earlier, but basically you can, it's like one of those, um, the, uh, the kind of tape gun, tape gun things. Um, this is in a, in a pig model. And basically the take home here is, this is the control after I think 20 days of after they did the, they, they did the wound. And basically the cells haven't really re re grown very well and you can still see the wound clearly in the histology. So this is a slice through one of these wounds here. But with the bio-ink skin, it's grown very nicely. And the idea, this is done without a graft. So that sounds good, but what that means is like, they haven't had to cut off a bit of the person 
to then, or the pig, and stick it, you know, to fill in the gap, basically. So the idea for this is some graphs are too big. You know, you might have a wound that's so big that it's not possible to get a graft big enough. So you have to basically decide which bit is more important. But if you could um, basically cover this with this bioink um, skin, then you wouldn't have to make those decisions. Thank you for joining us for this video of 3D MedNet at the Pint of Science Festival in May 2018. You can watch other videos from this series via the website at www.3dmednet.com or join the conversation via Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn.